Hi there and welcome to our fireside chat here on Capital View. Yes, it's a new year, a very happy new year to you. It's an appropriate time to look back at the year that was 2014 and look ahead to the year that is 2015. And joining me to look back and look ahead are two voices who represent, in a sense, two different ideological viewpoints. Siddharth Vadarajan, senior journalist, someone who has been critical of the Modi-led government in the past, and Surjit Bhalla, economist and commentator, someone who does believe that on occasion we must give the Modi government the benefit of the doubt. Thank you so much for joining me. Siddharth, let's start with you. We've seen Mr. Modi, the campaigner, in the year 2014. In 2015, are we looking to see Mr. Modi, the deliverer of what he promises? Well, the clock actually began to tick uh, as soon as he took office, because having uh, marketed himself as a great administrator, somebody with enormous amount of uh, experience running Gujarat and having delivered <coughs> one miracle after the other, uh, I don't think he had the luxury of uh, essentially wasting six months the way that he's done. Uh, so yes, 2015, he has to start delivering for sure. Uh, but I don't think uh, there is any uh, excuse for uh, the kind of um, governance that we've seen in the, in the past six months. The tone and tenor is set early in, early in his administration and his in inability to, uh, first of all, the excessive centralization, uh, inability to delegate, uh, the you know, inability to deal with uh, pressure from the Sangh Parivar, uh, the manner in which this so-called development agenda on which he won the election has been diluted. Uh, all of this is very clear. Surjit, let me pick that up and put it to you. He's the most powerful prime minister, many would say, in 30 years, uh, since 1984, since that mandate of Rajiv Gandhi. Why is such a powerful prime minister finding it so difficult or perhaps being so cautious in putting forward his point of view openly and in delivering what he promises. I think we are being a bit unfair because of the following reason. He heads the BJP. The BJP is a house very much divided. Then there is allusion to the Jansang, the RSS, <clears throat> that they are, if you will, controlling, robot-like uh, what he's doing or puppet-like what he's doing and what he's not doing. I happen to think that he is very much his own man. He does not owe allegiance to anybody within the BJP and certainly not to the RSS. So he comes in with, as you said, a fantastic majority. And actually it goes back. Rajiv Gandhi's thing was a temporary blip. But you have to go back to the 60s to get a mandate like he did. So, or the early 70s, 1971, I think was the last time you had a comparable mandate. So what we have is a powerful mandate. People have spoken. He, I think, recognizes what he is expected of him. Make no doubt about it. But he is trying to balance the various forces he doesn't want. There is the RSS. And they have... But the question that arises is, is this most powerful prime minister in 30 years in control of the parivar within? Yes, I think he is. And let me just point out as to what are the signposts that we should be looking at. Clearly, let me just be very clear, on the non-economic side, it appears that he is not in control. But on economic issues, we have, he's already delivered, I think, more in the last six months than in the previous 10 years. And I would say, if we wait till February, He's only two months now. He's already delivered more in the last yes. six months. Yes. Let me let me point at how. Years. Let me point at how. He has managed to start because it's a concurrent subject, state and center, to reform the labor laws, starting from Rajasthan, moving on to Madhya Pradesh, and now I think, and therefore I'm just extrapolating, but we can meet again in a year and see whether I'm right or wrong. That this will spread. So labor laws, reform of labor laws, number one. Number two the GST, which, if you will, is pretty much on its way. Mm -hmm. This is major reform. Right. This also, that every is government going to be big. for the last that 10, 15 years, no, just take these two. I don't even have to go anywhere else. Even these two are important. Let me just put that to you, actually. In the year ahead, in 2015, what is going to be the biggest challenge? Getting the economy on track, or is it going to be social cohesion? What Surjit talked about is the can... voices in the sun. What is going to be the bigger challenge? I don't think you can separate the two, because there is a clear sense in which the lack of social cohesion or the violation of social harmony, the d disruption of social harmony, which the Sangh Parivar is bent upon a a accomplishing across the country, 
and which the BJP for electoral reasons, and Mr. Modi perhaps, or Mr. Shah for electoral reasons, is happy to allow this state of affairs to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't have a situation where, as Surjit says, Modi is in charge of the Sangh, mm -hmm. and he is unable then to enforce you know, this famous moratorium that he announced. August 15th, uh, 2014. There should be a 10-year moratorium on communal you know, statements and communal politics. You know, within days of his saying that, uh, Uttar Pradesh BJP launched the Love Jihad campaign. VHP started saying all kinds of god-awful things. Uh, so you can't have that kind of situation. And then when, when BJP ministers are pressed about the RSS, they say, no, RSS is a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. It's a great organization. We owe our allegiance to it. It's the, it's the mother organization. So something has to give. So something has to give. So who is the real Mr. Modi? You know, who is the real Narendra Modi? Is it the Narendra Modi who is sympathetic to the RSS when Mohan Bhagwat says there's going to be a Hindu Rashtra, when Yogi Adityanath talks about love jihad, is that the real Mr. Modi? Or is the Mr. Modi the one on the GST, on labor reform, on uh, reforming infrastructure, on bringing in investment? No. So there is, a, there is a kind of duality there in the persona. And it's, it's going to scuttle, just to finish I mean, your question, it's going to torpedo, like all the positive that you see, is likely to get torpedoed by the, the more the more of this nonsense that you have. Because the two are surely related, no, no. aren't they? The two are surely Absolutely. related. Uh, look, the easy answer as to who is the real Modi, who, is, who should the real Modi look like, let's look at the election. The election did not vote him in with his largest mandate in 40 years because of love jihad. They did not. Or are we in the media overemphasizing the hotheads? Are we focusing too much on the fringe elements? Should we actually look at what the government is doing, what Mr. Modi is doing? Are we focusing too much on the other Pianats and the Sakshi Niranjana? I don't think, Niranjana, think, I don't think we are Sakshi focusing, Maharaj, I don't Niranjana, think we Niranjana, focused enough, quite frankly. Niranjana, uh, I don't think we saying? focused enough, quite frankly, because, you know, it's, it's not, these people are part, they're, they are the product of one grand organization. Mm -hmm. They come from the same ideological worldview. Uh, and the fact is that the Prime Minister, like, all of this would go away if right. the Prime Minister were to say, please go away. If he, if he were to open his mouth and publicly criticize, mm -hmm. which is something he's been extremely reluctant to do. So I think that, you know, partly it's his own silence and refusal to, in, to, uh, to deal with these elements right. that has given them a larger-than-life, uh, you know... A, uh, right, I mean, uh, just, just, to look ahead, just to look ahead to this year, surely the budget... The next budget is going to be the most important political moment of the year because it's going to signal and of the whether, next five years. and for the next five years whether Mr. Modi is an instinctive reformer like you believe that he is, or whether he's actually a play safe, very cautious person for whom the politics will actually dictate the economics. So, do you believe that the budget, the upcoming budget, is going to be the most political moment as far as Modi Look, is concerned? Two points. First of all this budget will be the most important budget that Modi ever presents. Because if he, if he falters on this one, I think he's done for politically, be a gradual decline. And if he performs in this one, I think he's there for five years or even more. But I want to come to the following, that look, the battles that he is facing, and I mentioned labor laws, etc. There are two people, and we keep mentioning the, the RSS and its views. There are two organizations whose views on economics are identical and have been for the last 30 years or 40 years. It's the left and, if you will, the RSS, the Swadeshi Jagwan Manch. They have identical economic views. You just look at each one of them. That's the battle he's facing. Now, do you think that Modi subscribes to the communist view? Left. You think Modi subscribes to the communist view of economics? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. So, therefore, if we want to interpret what is going on, the battles within, it is that he is faced with a large section of his organization, mm -hmm. BJP, even including some ministers who subscribe to the Swadeshi Jagannath. The thing is that the economic agenda of uh, Mr. Modi is very clear. Uh, he got elected with unprecedented support from the Indian corporate sector, which has a certain definition of reforms that they want to see. It includes labor reforms, of the kind that we've seen so far, but not of a wholesale reconfiguration of the social contract mm -hmm. at, at the workplace, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, the factory owner's right to retrench or to sack workers mm -hmm. goes hand in hand with a commitment to paying uh, uh, adequate uh, retrenchment, uh, which is something that none of them want to do, ensuring that every worker who works in a factory is on the rolls. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, we, we need to see more about this government's approach to labor reform. So far, what I've seen, uh, so that's not very convincing, but I think... Two things. One, you can't say all of this carries on because it didn't happen before. 
before Modi came on the stage. Okay, the Congress, if you will, supported these labor laws, brought in even more Neanderthal laws, like retrospective taxation, etc. So basically, there is a very distinct change in the economic atmosphere. But is second, there a danger? Second, one other thing about these corporates having elected Modi. Hello, what world are we living in, Goss? I mean, when, when, when did the corporates not elect APM? You think the Congress wasn't? if you will, under the influence of corporates? Where, where does anybody get their money from? We should reform our election laws and election funding. But to say that Modi was specially elected by the corporates infers or implies that the previous no. administrations were not specially no, elected no, 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 by no, no, the corporates. Hang on, hang on, Suji. That, that's not at all what I'm saying. Okay. Right? I'm saying yeah. that the corporates who decided to switch from Congress to BJP did so because they had an expectation of changes in policy, labor, you know, for yeah. example, they felt Congress were being too, you know, you're right. Congress was, nam from, a, from a big business point of view, Congress, Congress's drawback was that it was namby-pamby. Right. On land acquisition, mm -hmm. on labor reform, on, on fiscal, you know, on, on social welfare expenditure. So Modi has come here promising to be aggressive, an aggressive free marketeer, right? Having got elected, But is obviously, he an aggressive are, free marketeer? No, 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 I'm saying that. The labor laws affect 10% of our workforce out of which half is in the public sector. I've never understood. What is the political game over here? Who are we benefiting by keeping on with this Luddite laws? So therefore, I give up. So I don't know why, but I do think that given the start has been made, right. there will be fantastic progress mm -hmm. on the labor over the next year or so. Mm -hmm. Then, let us also not forget one big difference between what Modi is trying to do and what he is doing and the previous administrations, all 16 of them, however many we've had, is that in terms of welfare policies for the poor, the emphasis is much more on delivery, on actually benefiting the poor, it's a rather much than more, doing everything in the name of the it's poor. It's become a much more efficient and a much and more, administratively, more administratively streamlined process of delivering what the UPA so the was poor, earlier delivering. But the the is much more efficient. No, the poor will vote Modi. One second. See, well, it's very early days, right? So far, we've seen a surfeit of announcements, mm -hmm. declarations. Jandhan Yojana, which essentially has taken earlier financial inclusion schemes and doubled it. But there's still no certainty as to how this whole thing is going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, you have contradictory noises on the one hand, talking of efficient delivery of welfare. On the other hand, uh, today, given the kind of fiscal numbers we're looking at, there's talk of slashing ex expenditure. Uh, in the in the interim budget figures itself were cut for uh, the mm -hmm. allocations for uh, uh, welfare, social welfare were cut. Mm -hmm. uh, Narega, there's talk of it being diluted. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think the jury is out as to which direction, Mr. Modi. How how quickly? I think it's clear that he is going to uh, target uh, for for, I, for reduction. I, is Mr. Yes. Modi an instinctive reformer or not? You, we don't know yet. Well, the see, jury is out. No, no, you me, believe me, he I, is I, a I, reformer. You believe he is, is an economic he, reformer. He said, sir. When and he, he said is we going from to. two different ideological perspectives in the beginning, this was right on. <laughs> okay? Let us take each one of them. Right. LPG has started by Aadhaar, by, if you will, cash transfers, mm -hmm. which means that actually the poor get a lot of money. Second, cash transfers was, of course, the UPA scheme. It doesn't matter. It doesn't Labor matter. Labor reform was also a UPA scheme. Everything the fact we have he's done doing it. in our the fact life he's doing was it. a UPA idea. I mean, I don't care. Did they implement it? They reversed it. Food security, Narega. I mean, talk about the failure of this previous government mm. is Narega. One of the most corrupt, actually there are four corrupt programs in the world. I, I, don't, right. I don't want to go into those. But Narega is number four in the world. It is the most corrupt so you program. Believe, and even, but you believe even the signal so far, is now admitted. But the, you believe the signal so far is that Mr. Modi is working on the economics. Absolutely. He is trying to change. He is administratively efficient. And he is an instinctive reformer. You're believing yes. that the jury is very much out on whether or not Mr. Modi believes in a modern economy because he's overwhelmed, in a sense, by the cultural agenda. Let's take a short break at this point and come back with lots more in Capital View, looking ahead to the new year that awaits us. Welcome back to our fireside chat here on Capital View. We're looking ahead to the new year, to what awaits us in 2015 in terms of economics and in terms of politics. 
Let's come to the politics a little bit, Siddharth Vadarajan. Uh, we've seen the complete deadlock in the winter session, the opposition stalling the House. Now, as he goes forward, as Mr. Modi goes forward, do you think he's going to have to perhaps reach out to the opposition uh, a little more, work with the opposition a little more? Because uh, if you are too authoritarian and you don't speak or don't reach out to the opposition, you will end up with the kind of logjam uh, we had in the winter session. And surely that's not to the benefit of anyone. Uh, I mean, the logjam in the Rajya Sabha is... I mean, first of all, I think Lok Sabha has performed quite efficiently. Uh, uh, the Rajya Sabha logjam is due to two reasons. There's the general approach that the BJP and Modi has towards the opposition, uh, where you sort of snub the Congress by not giving them the formal title of opposition in Lok Sabha. You uh, pick a fight with Mamta Banerjee via Amit Shah, which you can't sustain on the basis of your own investigations. Uh, you um, uh, don't... Uh, sort of act in a timely way to diffuse crises that the Sangh Parivar is, are creating from time to time. Mm -hmm. So the standoff is entirely the product of this. Uh, the opposition is vastly depleted as, an, as a parliamentary force mm -hmm. uh, in some, and quite marginal really to the politics of the country today. You can't blame them for seizing every opportunity. Uh, even if uh, I think a lot of what they've done uh, you know, uh, looks very, very unreasonable that the house is being stalled day after day. But for them, this is a moment to get the government on the mat. And, and there is a solution for the government. I think this entire standoff that took place in the last uh, couple of weeks in December over conversion, reconversion, Modi could easily have issued a statement condemning mm -hmm. the activ activities of the Sangh Parivar. There's part of it uh, that I do agree with, Siddharth, and part I don't. Uh, I think the Congress, if you will, I, I for one, uh, don't believe the Congress should have been given the title of the leader of the opposition. Um, and I think the Congress is playing a very stupid tit-for-tat game uh, because the BJP did that to them. They're doing that to them. Having said that, if you will, there is the mark of a great leader. And if Modi is to be a great leader, he has to be, and I think there are two great leaders I have in mind, and you'll soon see why. None exist in the Indian pantheon. Uh, is, if you will, LBJ and mm -hmm. Lincoln make deals with the opposition. You want to get your policies through, you make deals. And he hasn't. The making deals has to do with, you can make bad deals, but here I'm talking about good deals, which are in the nation's interest. Um, you're not going to make deals about conversions or this or that. So keep out the social issues. You never need the social issues for making deals. You neglect them, benign neglect, and so on and so forth. But you make deals on economic grounds. You want to get laws passed. and if you will, it's best. Give a little, as you said, give a little. Is that how you'd like to see Mr. Modi go forward in 2015, to be a little more perhaps open even to the media? Perhaps take questions from the media, I, perhaps you know, uh, have a little more dialogue uh, with of, the media all, uh, and maybe hold a press conference. Of all his shortcomings in, in the six months that he's been Prime Minister, I think his failure to be open to questions mm -hmm. uh, is something that uh, worries me the most. I think it's bad for democracy. Uh, it's bad uh, that you, you have somebody who resorts just to this kind of one-way communication. Uh, and there is no opportunity. And it's not just him, right? The, a signal has gone down to the rest of the uh, government. Uh, so ministers are much more reluctant to engage in, uh, you know, spur-of-the-moment questions that journalists like to put. And, you know, in, a, in any vibrant democracy, you expect an answer. Uh, so you, you have a much more scripted uh, communication system that's now come up. Uh, and I think as a result, uh, you know, the job of the media has become uh, harder, mm -hmm. and one section of the media, a major section, has just given up and said, "Fine, you know, just we will act as cheerleaders for the administration and will not ask questions." Uh, so I think the <coughs> public discourse has has uh, has suffered as a result. And I think Mr. Modi needs to somehow break out of the shell. I don't he know. needs to break out of the shell because, you know, going forward, he is going to be tested. You know, the elections coming up are going to be in Delhi and Bihar where there is an opposition. There, there is going to be a rallying around Arvind Kejriwal. There is going to be the Lalu Nitish factor in Bihar. So he's going to face a challenge both in Delhi and, and think, Bihar, which is going know, to be the next election. So he's going to have to actually deal with an opposition in both these two upcoming I, elections. I, this is a very bad tradition. I don't know where it goes back to. Uh, but of... Prime Minister's not having regular press conferences. Where is the opposition, of course? How would you like to see the opposition evolve? Because even you, we were talking about Nitish and Lalu come to, coming together in Bihar, but where is the counter-narrative? It's just arithmetic. Asset, the single biggest asset of Mr. Modi in 2015 will be the continuing disarray in the camp of the opposition. The Congress party is refusing to address mm -hmm. the single most important question, which is the crisis of his leadership. Mm -hmm. 
I think these opportunistic alliances and realliances on the Janta Dal front, the left parties, etc., is not going to amount to much in, in terms of... I mean, it's just arithmetic. It may, it may yield tactical victories for them here and there, but in the long term, it's not going to generate something that's going to sustain... Because there uh, really is no counter-argument. And, and where is Rahul Gandhi? You know, all this time in the Lok Sabha, the opposition is taking on uh, the BJP. Where is Rahul he Gandhi? He is not a politician. This is the media or the Congress party or his mother made him to be a politician. He's not one. I'm very happy for him. I'm sure he's much happier today than he's ever been in the last 10 years. So now, for forecast for 2015, I think, look, uh, uh, it's good to end on a note of, uh, of agreement that the Modi's biggest asset is the opposition. There isn't one. And I think what we will see over the next two, three years, mm -hmm. and which is very healthy for our democracy, is a left of center alignment, a party. Call it X. Party X, which will have elements of the Congress, which will have elements of Lalu's party, which will have elements of Samajwadi party, or whatever. And I think therein begins the two-party system in India. Let's just quickly do a zip through to foreign policy. Do you think uh, Mr. Modi is going to have to continue his reach out towards Pakistan rather than keep uh, relations in, a, in the sort of deep freeze? We saw the reach out that happened after the Peshawar killings. Uh, Mr. Modi did call and he did express uh, his sympathy. Do you think that kind of reach out has to happen to I think Pakistan? It's essential. It has to I think forward. it's essential. I think the mistake that we've always made is to equate engagement and dialogue with surrender. You, when you talk to somebody, you're not, you're not uh, uh, f squandering away your position. You're not handing over your positions on Kashmir or anything. But you're engaging, you're talking, and you're saying, fine, can I enlarge the constituency of those people in that country? You've seen the response in Pakistan uh, to what happened in Peshawar. And the criticism, very rare, mm -hmm. in, uh, that we've we never seen in the past, you know, somebody like Lakhvi getting bail. Mm -hmm. In Pakistani civil society, people are speaking out. So why would we not want to encourage that kind of trend? And if meeting the Prime Minister of Pakistan and having talks and dialogue, even if it doesn't produce solutions, is the way to do it. What's the harm? But somehow there's this sort of reluctance here that somehow if you meet Nawaz Sharif, then this is a betrayal of uh, everything India stood right. for. And, you know, it's, it's very, very irrational. So he approach. must continue with that I outreach. And what to. about relations with the United States? Of course, Barack Obama is going to be our guest at Republic Day Parade. So uh, where do you see, do you see that, that relationship built on that very important people-to-people -people dimension that there exists between India and the United States? Do you think that is the building block? And going forward, will that be the building block I, I think that Mr. Modi can not just work next with? Year, not just this year, if you will, but also um, going forward to the next three, four years, the U.S., India relationship uh, is going to go from strength to strength. It's going to be a very important international, if you will, bilateral relationship. Um, so I think, you know, I think, you know, one, one of the things about Modi that I always like to point out, that he is, he will, he will, not, only, he will not only go down in history as one of the smartest, if not the smartest politician India has produced, but also one of the luckiest, if not the luckiest. If not the luckiest. Uh, we're at so, the end of the program, so let me just end on a note of uh, hope for the future because, you know, what there is at the moment is a kind of polarized polity. You have the people who are opposed to Mr. Modi, you have the people who are pro Mr. Modi, and there's a kind of camp mentality that exists and two people are opposed to each other. Do you think Mr. Modi has to be a little bit of a bridge builder? Do you think he has to bring these two kind of warring camps together? Because at the moment, our public life is very, very polarized. They're not war but I agree with you. I think uh, through press conferences, through a bit more openness, etc., that bridge has to be built and will likely be built. Do you agree with that? You that know, there's two polarized policies at the moment. He, he has adopted. He and the BJP have adopted this George W. Bush doctrine that if you're not with us, you're against us. <laughs> so every question or criticism uh, is is uh, you know painted as you know this is pathological hatred of Modi, pathological hatred of BJP. They need to get real. A lot of people in this country have serious concerns. Should Mr. Modi be a little more open to criticism? Should, be a, should he be a little more open to dissent? It's not clear that he is not. It's not clear that he is not open to criticism. And I mean that very seriously. Um, we saw that last year when, you know, all of these social issues that we've talked about, he did come out. Uh, some of us would have liked him to have come out a bit earlier. But he did come out, did try and send the message. On corruption in high places, he sent out a message very early on in his administration. Um, so I think and this was a criticism on social issues, he's not talking out, etc. Then he finally did uh, speak. So I, you know, he is sending look, a I, message. I, I, so are we, are we, are we then one, one failing last. to I think a look at Mr. Modi a and his messages? A smart politician has to be open to 
uh, criticism. And I think, you know, his hallmark is that he's a very smart politician. Right. So I think otherwise it's suicidal. An enormously powerful man with the kind of support he has in parliament and outside. Were he to be a little more, little more vocal and reassuring different sections of India who feel vulnerable and threatened right now, I think he would, his stature would rise. Why he doesn't do that is a mystery to me, uh, which suggests that either he is not as strong as we think he is, or he's not as confident, or worse still, he subscribes to the ideology uh, and is reluctant to criticize oh, it. Said, he's reason. on a learning curve. He is on a learning curve. We're going to have to leave it there. Siddharth Badrarajan, Surjit Bhalla, thanks so much for joining me. And thank you so much for watching Capital View. This is our New Year edition where we're looking ahead towards optimism, but also hoping that the social incoherence of the Sangh Parivar does not overwhelm Mr. Modi's stated economic objectives. Thanks so much for watching. Tune in again next week. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.